I did immediately regret it in a sense where I called my mom and I apologized to her and I said, I'm so sorry, I think I killed your husband. Mm. But then there was also the sense of like, oh my gosh, I don't have to keep looking over my shoulders anymore. I don't have to live in this fear that he's gonna actually come after me because it already happened. I would kill them again. Three, two, one, go. Thomas Ogden was a beautiful person and he was my friend and what happened was an accident and I would, um, I would give anything to have him back. My name's Forrest and I accidentally shot and killed my best friend when I was 23 years old. I felt like a shattered person most of my life and there are still shards missing but I just spent the last five years um, writing a very painful memoir. It gave me an opportunity to visit a lot of past trauma. I feel in a strong space to be a support for other survivors and create positivity in the world. All my killing has been in the time of war, so I, I agree with what I've done. Would I do it again? I would, because if I didn't kill that individual, they would have killed me or somebody else. I was a sniper, so I'm looking after a platoon of 20, 30 guys, sometimes as small as six guys. But I don't like strongly agree with it because of the after effects, like what it did to me mentally. You know, I was the first person I killed, I was 18, and I didn't stop until I was almost 25. So I don't regret any of it. I don't have any bad feelings towards those individuals that I did kill. They were just protecting their homeland just as much as I would too. So I would do it again to save my life or somebody else's life. I work in healthcare. What I do is I manage life support. Mm -hmm. So I'm the guy that pulls the plug on mm -hmm. just about everybody. So I come from a very different perspective. I have to do that for babies all the way to like mm -hmm. people at the end of their lives. I've been doing this for like over a dozen years now. So I'm like, okay, I've come to terms with what the job is. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The, the crime and how it happened, it was not that I didn't go out to kill this person. Um, and now understanding the impact that the, the crime had, not only on me, but the family of that person, um, that was a human being that I killed over some drugs, right? And his children, his family is being, living still in the absence of this person. It was December the 24th, uh, Christmas Eve night. I remember me and a couple of my friends were hanging out. This particular car came up. Um, and the passenger in the car said, hey, I want to buy some drugs from you. So I told one of my friends, I'm like, he's known to be this person that will come through the community and ask for $100 worth of drugs, but he would never have some money. And the guy did exactly what I said. He knocked the drugs out of my friend's hand, grabbed his arm, and started speeding off. And my reaction at that time was I pulled out the gun and I started shooting into the car to get him to release my friend. And days later, we heard that the bullet that I shot into the car actually killed him. To that day, I will never forget December the 24th when that happened a day before Christmas. I would 100% do what I had to do over again because the guy was a serial perpetrator. He was after so many women. If he killed me, he would have went after my mom all my family, my nieces, my nephews, every one of us, until he literally got what he wanted. I'm Tara Newell. I killed my attacker, Dirty John Meehan, in self-defense. I think it was really interesting how there was one person here who had experienced prison reform, because to me, my attacker would have been in there if I hadn't killed him in self-defense. And it's really interesting to hear about how there are people in there who are able to re Habilitate. I immediately regretted it. Three, two, one, go. Why do I strongly strong disagree? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I was a young kid. I was 18. Um, the first guy I killed was uh, with a 50 cal like machine gun. I was expecting it to be like the movies where you have this like feeling of when you kill someone and it wasn't there, I didn't really feel anything. It wasn't until like that night I had this weird dream. Uh, the guy who I shot became a ceiling fan in my room. His arms and legs were the blades. His head was the center of the fan. 
and I watched him spin faster and faster until he tore apart and covered me in what he used to be, what was left of him. Um, but no, I didn't feel anything. There was nothing like to feel. I knew that was the beginning of something that I was probably going to have to do for a while. Um, no attachment at the time. I can agree with you on that. I mean, identify with that because my first couple of years inside of prison, I, I detach from it completely. When people would mention his name, I would like, don't see him as a human being. And that was very insensitive when I look back at it now, right? But, but I look and say that that was a way of me coping with the situation at that time. I did immediately regret it in a sense where I called my mom and I apologized to her and I said, I'm so sorry, I think I killed your husband. Mm -hmm. So there was that, but then there was also the sense of like, oh my gosh, I don't have to keep looking over my shoulders anymore. I don't have to live in this fear that he's going to actually come after me because it already happened. Sometimes family members don't agree with the decision and that decision is sometimes taken away from them. Being called every name in the book as I'm walking in there, but if they just don't agree and then I'm like, I just have to go do this now, you know? But it doesn't feel good or like, I'm not necessarily agreeing with it. So I'm like, I'm like uh, I disagree, yeah. Uh, the level of heartbreak that I felt uh, immediately after that gunshot um, was indescribable and uh, I don't know if any of you have saw Red before, but I actually saw Red. Um, and it was the most uh, horrific thing I've ever seen, experienced, witnessed, felt in my life. I got charged with first degree murder that night and I was looking at doing 35 to life here in California. I couldn't even process that. There was just so much a combination of horror and grief immediately. I am desensitized to death. Three, two, one, go. Somewhat agree. Why is that? Yeah, why is that? I do a lot of volunteer work, and the amount of people who are dying from drug overdoses and suicides right now um, in the arena of trauma, it's, it's be becoming difficult for me to feel anything anymore mm. with the amount of people that we're losing that we don't have to. For me, it was almost like playing God, you know? I determined the time, place, when I'm gonna take uh, that person off this planet. And it put things into perspective for me too, that I could be going at any certain time. Like when you have to pull it, you know, it's, you don't know when that card is gonna be pulled. So I've learned to value it more and know that it's very fragile, very frail and to not feel anything towards killing someone would probably be more devastating to me than actually taking the life, it's not feeling. Hold on, I need to clarify something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I just wanna be very clear that being desensitized um, in no way means that I don't value life. Oh, yeah. It's I'm just sure. difficult to, to um, manage the feel the mourning over and over and again. Over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I agree with you, like, there'll be certain stories that I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. But if someone just tells me like, oh, I, that person died of a heart attack, I'm just like, oh, okay. Mm. Like, it just like, there's no traumatic incident with that. So I'm like, my brain just disassociates and it's like, okay, oh, they died naturally, so. And uh, from where I come from, like, I, I get to know a lot of these people. If I don't get to know them, I get to know their family members, like, very intimately. It's not immediate, like, oh, they're coming in and they're gonna, they're gonna go. No, it's, it's like weeks, months. I've had somebody, like, uh, their, their five-year-old son, and he was in the room, and I'm like, uh, I gotta take your mom away now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, after that, I'm like, oh my God, I, I go call my mom or I go call my dad. It's like, it's really heavy. But I feel, like you said, like a sense of maximization of like, I don't know when my number is gonna be called. Cause even if I'm working in the emergency room, we've worked on somebody for two hours and they're like, we really can't do anything anymore. And I'm like, just like that, gone. I remember this one patient, it was very much like nobody was there. We just, they just found him on the street. He didn't even have a wallet. He was clinically dead brain-wise, so we couldn't really do anything anymore. Me, the nurse, and the doctor just stayed in that room until his heart rate left. 
because we didn't want to see him um, leave by himself. That was um, one of the most, uh, what's it called, sobering moments too. It's like, as much as it was nice for us to do that, I just don't want strangers around me, you know, seeing me off. I think for me as a teenager, um, selling drugs, just hanging in the streets, just living a lifestyle that I didn't care if I killed someone. I was very desensitized. I didn't care. I didn't feel no remorse for it. And this is part of, was part of my own personal development. I needed to find a way to attach to that. So I started doing this hospice training inside of one of the prisons. And by listening to these individuals tell their story and the regrets that they were living with in their process of transitioning, it gave me a sense of a value of life now, you know, um, and it shifted my mindset as this teenager who was very callous towards um, um, life at that time. I've taken care of people, they're be, they're being on life support. They'll hang on for like a very long time till one specific person sometimes just visits Yo, I them. See, I see, I... And then I'm like, I can't explain that. <laughs> I could take them off and they'll be, their heart rate will keep going and going and going. One of the guys I was working with in the prison, um, he wanted to see his sister. Yes. So this dude held on until like his sister walked into the room and, and, and she, and he was like not consciously but like she spoke to him and she started like talking to him and you started seeing the move. And then soon as she was like, she was like, I'm leaving. And like within minutes, it's got like transition. Yeah, with my situation, I made him brain dead. And so he was in the hospital. And then when they pulled the plug on him, my mom literally had to tell him it's okay to go now. And then he left. Wow, some weird things crazy. about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we're more than just our brain, right? Yeah. We're spirits living in flesh, man, yeah. that's all. I am also a victim. Three, two, one, go. I feel weird. <laughs> <laughs> You're not trying to single you out. <laughs> but I feel like I have to be over here because the guy came after me. I was in a parking garage. I was just trying to go to the Jason Aldean concert that night. He started attacking me, stabbing me, and I fought back and I won. So I didn't ask for any of that. I honestly hated the guy and I wished he would be dead, but I never wanted to unalive or take someone's life. My first couple years in prison, I saw myself as the victim, mm. right? And that was, again, a way of me coping. As I continued to do some interpersonal work, I realized that I was not a victim, that I still made a choice in the crime that I committed, right? But I'm just, I just wanted to share that. Like, I, I, I'm, I wanted to run over there, but I'm in this place of healing and reconciliation and I had to like move away from the victimization mindset and take ownership for the decision that I actually pulled the trigger, um, committed the crime unfortunately, and someone died, and I have to take that on because that's part of my own personal growth and development. I remember on a Friday night, three years into my incarceration, I remember laying in my bed watching this show called Dateline, and for the first time I heard a mother really expressing her loss for the loss of her loved one, and that was that moment in my life where I connected with that. I'm like, yo, I did the same thing. And I, and I went into a fetus position and I started praying, and all I kept hearing in that, and my hearing this voice saying, I have forgiven you, you have to ask Gary, the guy that you killed, to forgive you. And in that process, this is where I began. I remember saying, Gary, would you forgive me? And I literally felt like in that moment, he forgave me and I heard it. And it's almost like a weight was lifted off of me. And that's when I began this, this cleansing, this, this process of healing and moving forward and, and finding a purpose and finding my voice and all of that, that particular night inside of that prison when I surrendered to it. Now, I don't feel like I'm a victim for anything. Like I chose that path. Started off wanting to be a Navy SEAL when I was like in elementary school. My mom helped me make my first ghillie suit when I was in the sixth grade. Wow. Like it's something I've always wanted to do and I knew it came with that, which was more than likely having to kill someone, especially in the time of war. Yeah, I'm not a victim, but the only thing I would say is like, they don't really prepare us into doing the job that we do. They, you know, they do the day to day thing. Oh, this is what you do, this is what you chart and all that stuff. And then now you're like, Oh, by the way, the doctor wrote the order, um, go take him off and now I gotta walk in or like if it's a baby, they're still holding them in their hands and stuff and like go take them off. And so I never really thought about it. Like nobody's like talked to me or anything like, by the way, uh, 
is where you're going to feel it afterwards or like when you get home after you clock out and everything like that. Yeah, we didn't have a handbook on that either. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they teach you how to kill, but there's no how to process how that. to process it. I have profited from the murder. Three, two, one, go. Make me feel bad about this. Some like, come word. <laughs> that, that word's kind of strong. Yeah. Blood <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. money. Yeah. 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 Why don't you like that word? I don't like it. All right. Either. A. Um, I don't think it applies universally. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Homicide is a universal term. As far as profiting from any part of my story, no. Um, I've spent the last four years five years struggling to write and publish a book and I spent about 80 G's on it mm. and made about 4,000. And that, that's not why I did it. I did it because I want to help people, but I don't think that it's very common for people to profit off of recovery from stuff, right? Well, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, I guess I'll go over here then. My attacker, my show got made into a podcast called Dirty John. And then it got made into a documentary a TV show on Bravo and now on Netflix. And so I felt like I've been exploited in the sense because I did not make anything off of the podcast. Although people think I profited off my story, I did not. But also, and you get paid to take his life. No, not at all. Okay, so if you profited off of any, if I profit off of anything, it's my hard work afterwards. Yeah. It's my hard work to share and be of service. So, no, you didn't. People hate profit sometimes. They yeah. just hate yeah. you just because yeah. you made money. Yeah. For me as a, as a speaker and a trainer, um, I struggled with that for a long time, right? You know, I committed this crime. And yes, I did all of the work that I've done to become the man that I am today. But then I sometimes, I don't, I don't sleep at night right knowing that I've made this bag of money or whatever. Any money I get, I wanna be able to live comfortable. It's not about getting something in luxury. How could I help some young person? So we do, do the nonprofit work. But my t five year goal now, a 10 year goal, is to you whatever profit I make is to create a foundation in honor of Gary. Going back to that promise I made to him almost 30 years ago inside of a prison cell. Mm. It initially started as me writing a journal. Uh, my dad suggested I, I did that. I was going through a, a hard time self-medicating and contemplating some bad decisions. Started off as that and it got picked up by a major book publishing company and it went on to become uh, essentially like an autobiography of that time in. Um, after accomplishing that, I went on to what I do currently, which is write you know, novels and stuff like that, not based on my life because I did feel a certain way about it, of profiting from killing, you know? I get what you're saying too. All the work that you put in there after, that's on you, you know? But I also see it as, well, I killed all these guys and I wrote a book about it and profited from it. Were you an E4 or E5? E5, yeah. That's all the money you made of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Once again, complex issue that gets lumped together. If somebody has money, they must be doing something, something for bad. profit. Yeah. And I think wh where an answer is, I mean, do we follow purpose or do we follow the money? Mm -hmm. It's gonna go away when I die. It's not gonna matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's gonna matter when I die is what I did. Exactly. Am I proud of myself yeah. for the things that I did? Mm -hmm. I often see money more of like as an amplifier for what people can do, what reach they can do. Yeah, what you can make impact on now, like yeah. knowing like when I go speak to young people today about gun violence and about my story, the only way they can get out of a situation is if I have money. Yeah. yeah. Right. That I can create a, a safe space for them to go after school. So I have to make some money to be able to do Great. that. You know what I mean? But yeah. I don't want to make a bunch of money and I'm living here and then <laughs> yeah. I walk yeah. into the community yeah. and say, hey, hey, young kids, put the guns down. Prison, say no to prison. <laughs> yeah. And then I drive away in this nice car and forget <laughs> yeah. about them. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. where I'm at. Like purpose for me is about how do I make impact in the lives of the people that I serve? Taking a life was part of God's plan for me. Mm. Three, two, one, go. I'm unclear with that one. That's, that's, that's why I'm like this. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the other side. <laughs> yeah, that's, I wouldn't be who I am today to be able to have the experience that I've had and become who I've become uh, without taking a life. 
I learned my lesson after all the killing. You know, my last deployment dropped over 30 guys, 33 people, and who knows how many before that. But what I had to get through and overcome to stand here today far exceeded anything I've done in the military. Being emotionally somewhat strong and, yeah, what I've had to overcome. There's been a lot of dark nights where I didn't think I was going to be here, you know? Well, I'm like this. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean, though, yeah. <laughs> I don't want it to be perceived to be insensitive about the victim. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? But I know on this part of me, I look at my friends who I grew up with at 19 years old, and I did 22 years in prison, and when I came back home, they were at the same, at the same spot under the same tree we sold drugs at. Mm. But then if I, over here, I think about the Goldinger's family, because, you know, their son is like, oh, God destined my son, my brother or my son to die, you know what I mean? So, but if you believe in God, then that would be, he already knew that before you I were get home, that part. You know? I mean, I'm a spiritual man, yeah, right? Yeah, but same. I'm just like, I don't want it to, I don't, it's just, that's, that's my dilemma when it if comes to God. Yeah. I don't think that he's letting some kid be blown apart in Iraq because he's busy helping me look for a parking space, mm. yeah. right? Yeah. I don't think that the realm of the spirit is yes. as concerned with human affairs. Absolutely. I think that the sun rises and sets for a reason. Yeah. The, it rockets through space at 40,000 miles an hour with a bunch of rocks around it for a reason. Yeah. And animals have instinct for a reason. And I think human beings Free will. It's a little Free different, will. Free and will. I think yeah. things just happen sometimes. There doesn't yeah. have to be meaning or a plan. Yeah. Um, but then it's hard for a person who lost a loved one to wrap that. For me, yeah. and my uh, homicide is completely different than most of you in this room. Mm -hmm. Is someone died by me pulling this trigger, and and I can't say it was in God's plan. I pulled the trigger too. Yeah. I thought the gun was empty, mm. and I still can't wrap my head around a stupid decision like that. Mm. Even though that it malfunctioned and acted unloaded. Had I done all the right things, the four safety rules, it never would have happened. Mm -hmm. And I still, I was nervous coming here yeah. because I can't, I don't know what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking. Mm -hmm. And I had no intent at all. There's no way in my, I would have as soon put it to my head um, or at the floor or whatever. I, and, and I can't remember ever doing that before or after. And it was a mistake. Mm. I think for me, it was part of my dharma. I'm a little bit more spiritual, so I think it was my life's purpose, to be honest, because of what I do today. Whenever I speak, I always have people contact me and say that they left an abusive relationship or what I shared helped them get out of their attack. Sharing your story helps other people. Yeah. And yeah. You feel that... Yeah, I call it transparency sure. transports people. Yeah. That's why I'm like really honest about who I am because there's someone else, not just in a physical prison, but an emotional, mental prison. And by hearing your story, hearing all of our stories, it helps transport them to another space of showing that I can't escape this particular prison. After having this discussion, Lester, choose a side. <laughs> <laughs> really? Can't make you. This I'm just going to say, I don't think it's fair to make you choose a side. Yeah. Mm. You believe what you believe. I'm going to stand just a little bit over there. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> like, respectful. I really like what you did, man. Because we move in seconds and inches. Yeah. And we ah, measure progress in like, yeah, years right and here. years, you know? Yeah. That was kind of a lot. What's up? This episode was just sort of intense, and I think I need a little time to debrief now. Life's got you down bad, huh? Yeah, just a little, you know, sometimes I need a big hug or some reassurance that everything will be okay in the world, you know? Here, try the Skylight app. Maybe it can help you feel connected to the universe a little more and help you feel more grounded. Skylight welcomes you to discover more about yourself and your spirituality, regardless of your life path and the stressful thoughts and anxieties that may come with it. With a new YouTube channel and app, Skylight is focused on helping you meditate and calm your thoughts when you need that extra hug. And if you don't know exactly what spiritual self-care means to you yet, Skylight can be your new BFF to help you explore that. Wait, hold on, this Skylight video on living the fullest life before you die? Take my money. Actually, you won't be needing that at all because Skylight is like your new best friend, there whenever you need it and free of charge so you can put your wallet away. Anyway, I've got to go now, but I'm here whenever you need me. 
just visit me anytime at youtube.com slash at Skylight Your Life or the Skylight app at skylight.org. Well, thank you, Skylight, for sponsoring this portion of the video. I'm ready to finish this episode now. There are enough resources for me to heal. Three, two, one, go. When I was in the military, it was uh, like looked down upon to go seek mental help or anything. Dude, you'd get kicked off the team, you know, in a heartbeat. Mm. I don't want a guy who's soft watching my back, you know, or what I perceived at the perceived time to at be the soft. Time, yeah. 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 Um, after each deployment, our therapist was like a 18-wheeler truck full of kegs of beer and more beer. And 12 hours ago, I just took a life, 21 years old, at a strip club in Atlanta, drinking, you know, till my eyes pop out uh, to cope. We would talk to like a psychiatrist, but we were encouraged to write down, you know, I didn't have this emotion, I didn't see this, I, so we could get home early to see our family. But two years ago, two or three years ago, I decided to actually to talk to someone and figure out why I was the way I was, because I wanted to change. I didn't like being everywhere I went, you know, I'm looking at everyone and have a, this is gonna sound so bad, but I was polite to everybody who I met, but I always in the back of my mind had a plan to kill them, just in case the situation pre prevent, uh, presented itself. If something went south, I've already mapped out and planned for three different scenarios how I would kill this person. And I was comfortable being in that state of mind because it kept that oh, protection, you know, that wall up. But I, it, gets, it gets tiring after a while to, yeah. to always be that way. You, you know, know, for me, I look at this, right? I want to run over here um, to the strongly disagree. It's almost because of the length of your sentence and you, like I was serving life, I didn't become eligible for most of the classes in prison until I came down to my last three years in prison, wow. right? Now I have to run back over here to strongly agree after being a person who's been released from prison. I've learned these different things that now help me to cope with all of the stuff that comes with me uh, living inside of a prison, not only being um, a person who took someone's life, but seeing other individuals get killed inside of the prison, right? You see people get stabbed in prison over some of the simplest things. No one would come and, and talk to you about like, was that triggering for you? Wow. How did you, you saw this person blood spill out over the concrete, nothing, right? This is why I challenge the prison system and anyone who works in that prison environment to create more mental health services for those in prison because yes, that person may have committed a violent crime, but we don't know their story. I'm like that with the military, man. Yeah. There's not enough, in my, my opinion. Yeah. It's VA, not encouraged enough, yeah. The VA helped me somewhat, right? I'm not somewhat. gonna say the VA didn't help, but when I was suicidal, I didn't call the VA helpline because I didn't want to sit here and fill out a strongly agree and disagree form mm -hmm. and wait in a waiting room. Mm -hmm. And I called another brother and he sent me to a program called Save a Warrior mm -hmm. and I experienced something, it might sound weird, called initiation there. Mm -hmm. The participant faces their own death and they receive a transitional object. And something about that changed my psyche and something clicked. And we did stuff like the ceremony for the dead there where we write the names of the people we've lost and the people we've killed and we get to cry and like wow. feel and process and become human again because war can break us and prison mm. can break us and make us incomplete and not human. And when we use different modalities to place that humanity back together, then we can have community, mm. right? And community is the antidote to a lot of human suffering. Yes, sir. I wrote a 12-step program for vets and first responders called SPARTA, mm -hmm. Suicide Prevention and Resilience Training Anonymous. We meet once a week. And, and I used to think there wasn't enough resources. And at, the more I get involved, it's not that the help isn't needed, it's that there's abundant ability to create resources, mm. right? And once we, we break that, we start to be the creator of it, we create the small nonprofit that serves the area. Yeah. It, it's like, like the matrix fails, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was long, sorry. No, <laughs> oh, you're yeah. good. Well, I have to apologize for like chuckling when you said that part because I was like, oh wait, I have a plan to kill people too, unfortunately. And then I was, I used humor as my trauma response sometimes. So I strongly agree that I have the resources and the tools I need because I'm gonna forever be on my healing journey. 
and I'm always going to look for them and find them. However, therapy, talk therapy, I don't think is very beneficial to a lot of people. I think that a lot of therapists need to learn about the nervous system because a lot of what we went through, we had to use our fight response. So I have to learn how to calm my nervous system to get to homeostasis to the baseline. It's like as a person of color, it's like growing up, like as an immigrant, it's more like it is what it is. When you like things happen to you, it's like, yeah. you don't really like, oh yeah, go see your therapist or anything like that. Especially working through the pandemic, I have never seen like that much death. Yeah. In, in my whole life, and I've been doing this for, at the time, like 10 years. And this was before the vaccine, and I'm like, I don't see the end of this tunnel yet. For me to quit the job would mean other people would die. Mm. And for me to continue this job, meaning I would die. And then that was the first time I'm like, I really don't know what to do right here. And that's the first time I'm like, wait, there's this thing called therapist. Maybe I should go talk to one. I wish it was more readily available and accepted at the same time because none of my friends go and see their therapist and I can completely tell them like, you wouldn't have certain amount of issues if you just kind of worked on yourself in a different way. You know, to or maybe not a therapist, but like a different way, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, like coaching. Well, like, right here too, again, I want to run over here, <laughs> right? Went in prison at 19, walked out, I was 41, into a completely different world, uh, right? Wow. So now like my organization, Path of Redemption, is that I want to provide that service. Like how do, how do you cope with when you walk into a grocery store after 20 years and you walk in a self-serving line, you got to swipe that card and you don't know how, or you walk through a line and, and it beeps, right? Yeah. And you think that it's going to be tackled by the police because yeah. they think you're stealing something, right? And this is why like you and I and individuals can create that. <laughs> exactly. you're going to be made. I'm running over All right. it. So there, there is not, <laughs> not by any means enough space to talk about, like I was a foster kid, right? So I got raised in poverty and abuse and negative relationships. So what did I do when I grew up? Yeah. I created poverty and I created negative relationships, right? And that type of a wound, it's such a cultural taboo yeah. that there's not a space to talk about that and the impacts and then what do we do and where do we go yeah. from there. So, I'm, so, so so come on back over here. You got me feeling right. kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I was saying I wanted to do it, right? But I think, I, I think that's important, man. And everybody in this circle is a wounded healer yeah. and also a servant leader, right? So when we see a gap in something that's needed, it's not just us. Yeah. So that, that's where a tremendous opportunity is to create and be of service to, to other people like us. I would say it was dope talking to y'all, like yeah. learning the different angles of, because I was kind of like skirmish about that title killer, but listening to all of the different facets and challenges of it, you know, I really appreciate it for me. I go back to South Carolina and go back into the Department of Juvenile Justice and work with these young people. This is what I want to take back, right? Like this, yeah. I want to take that. Same boat, yeah. man. A lot of preconceived notions we have about people. I might look at you a certain way, you or you, and never would have had a clue that there's a commonality or something we can all relate on and learn from. It's not every day you get to meet someone that's taken a life or, you know, and for me it's made me feel alone at times and not be able to be understood by people because of the emotions and stuff that we have to go through. I agree. <laughs>